This is Robert P. Fitton, known in the Matthias Jones Mysteries as R.P. Fitton. This is not a time travel book. This is a different type of mystery series about murder, except it has some levity in it. Now, how can you have humor and levity in murder? Well, the main concentration of the plot is, of course, unraveling the murder. But then you have wacky characters in the town of Hamilton, New Hampshire, who are all trying to contribute their own version of what their theory of, of the murder is. Sometimes they're right on target. Sometimes they're way off base. But they all center around a certain character. This is the son of an Indiana detective who was murdered in the line of duty and his murder uncovered by his son, Matthias Jones. Well, Matthias Jones is not a cop, he's not an investigator, but he does possess many of the basic instincts of his late father in investigating murders and learned a lot from his father with these instincts. Jones was a superb athlete who went on to become a coach and ended up in Hamilton, New Hampshire, coaching and being an athletic director of a small college in Hamilton, New Hampshire, the fictitious town along the coast of New Hampshire. Now, what is some of the background of this? If we look, if we look at some of the uh, 1960s TV series, some of them are, are really wacky. I go back to the series that was on and way out. They have from 1965 to 71. Hogan's Heroes was despised by many as trying to gather humor out of a POW camp in Germany. Well, the thing is that the POWs always outsmarted their captors and uh, long cavalcade of characters that added levity to the show was what made it work. I understand the underground will release Colonel Klink if the Gestapo frees Hans Wagner. Isn't that what they're demanding? Yes, that's what they're demanding. Clint goes free if Wagner goes free. I certainly call that a fair deal. Yeah, so would I, if I were on the other side. <laughs> Hans Wagner is the brains of the entire underground operation. He's highly intelligent, courageous, and a leader. What about Colonel Clink? What about him? <laughs> well, he's also a man of outstanding qualities, right, Schultz? Absolutely. Such as? <laughs> oh, there are so many. Name one. Well, they're not that. <laughs> execution takes place tomorrow. A schedule. And then Wagner's brother shoots Colonel Clank. Now, come on, General. Think of how long you've known Colonel Clank. Think of the things you two have been through together. If I do, I'm liable to shoot him myself. <laughs> I don't exactly do this in the Matthias Jones series, but... What I wanted to do with Matthias Jones was the tension between Jones and the locals. It's a good-hearted tension because Jones, while he gets frustrated by these these characters in the town, uh, always ends up still being loyal to the town and to the college. The Strange Death of Dr. Povich Chapter 1 Dr. Povich should have died long ago. His heart problems left him confined to death watches for months last year, and now, although miraculously recovered, his condition remained questionable. Father Gallagher, after years of antipathy toward Povich, invited him to St. Bart's Rectory for a dinner of reconciliation. Matthias Jones worried whether Gallagher's temper might break through his priestly demeanor and rattle Povich's fragile heart. Jones slowed his jeep at the narrow road leading up to Mount Polaris. A chain gate was open and a single plowed lane produced lumpy snowbanks from last night's storm. The swollen birch branches hung heavy and the pines stooped toward the road. He had always wanted to look into deep space from the large telescope atop this mountain north of Hamilton, but he did not fancy himself driving up the Mount Polaris road in the aftermath of the biggest storm to pelt southern New Hampshire in ten years. Fred Dempsey had told him the clear, cold night would provide an excellent viewing opportunity. He shifted his jeep into four-wheel drive and turned to Duff. So, how did you end up at Prince William on a Tuesday night, Duff? Duff said nothing for a few moments and stared out the window. Well, I was supposed to meet a girl. Jones glanced in the rear mirror back toward the street gate as he moved up the incline. Woman, 
that can make you or break you. He raised his brows, especially if you don't have a car. Yes, coach. Let's face it, Duffy. You were leading all scorers last year, but now something's affected your play. I've got a lot on my mind. Dr. Povich, he's my advisor. He says I need to focus. Headlights bright in the snowbanks. He swerved the jeep slightly, but easily negotiated the steep road. You and the doctor are close. I heard that. He's your mentor. He is, and my advisor. He knows my story. Yeah, but does he know about outside jump shots? The freckle-faced Duff smiled, but continued to look out the jeep window. I've never been up here after a big storm. You sure it's cleared at the top? Well, I guess they plowed the top. I called campus security to unlock the gate. Bucky, you know Bucky. Oh, campus insecurity. Duff balanced his chin on his palm and stared silently into the passing trees lining the outside guardrail. Duff was edgy ever since he got in the jeep at the Hannibal Mall in Prince William. Jones held the wheel with one hand and kept his right hand on the stick shift, as if removing his hand from the lever might cause some great tactical problem. Bucky has his own ideas about police work. We have to keep reminding him he's in charge of the campus security and not a real cop. Duff stretched his long legs. He gave me a parking ticket two weeks ago. Jones shifted again and moved the jeep around the turn and started up a new hill. Oh, you don't own a car? While I was driving Bernie Gazinski's Toyota, I parked it like everyone else does next to the gym. Yeah, so what's the problem? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Bucky steps out of his little brown campus security car, pad flipped over and pen in hand. Jones nodded and laughed. Oh, I can see the whole thing. He waddles over in his uniform and tells me I'm in violation of Section 26 of the campus parking code. He said if I didn't move the car, he was going to have it towed off campus. Yeah, well, Bucky had Dean Kent's car towed. Of course, he didn't know it was Dean Kent's car, said Jones, shifting again. Never mind that Nigel Kent is also the president of Hamilton College and has a license plate marked Dean. So what happened with the Toyota? Duff pointed to Jones's blue parking sticker on the driver's side of the windshield. Well, I showed him Bernie's sticker. It's good through the academic year. Well, so what was the problem? He bends down on his hands and knees and starts crawling around on the pavement. He told me I was straddling the handicap space. I guess I was by a couple of inches. So he moves his pen around that little pad of his and rips off the sheet. Twenty-five bucks! Jones rounded the corner that led to the final hill to the observatory. Oh, come on! Seriously? Jones winced as he thought of traveling to an auto body in Prince William with Nigel and finding Nigel's Mercedes stuck between two rusted Ford Pintos from the 1970s. Duff, let me speak with Dean Kent, see if I can clear this ticket thing up. I think Bucky went a little overboard, said Duff, pausing and looking at Jones. Coach, I'm sorry. For what? They moved along the snowbank, now covering the guardrail high above the valley. Things are bothering me. Jones shifted again. The narrow plowed road leveled in the headlights. You want to talk about it? Duff shook his head. Well, I will. Okay. Jones tried to change the subject as he moved through the plowed snow. Dr. Povich looked healthy when I talked to him at the last game when he invited me up here. Well, Dr. Povich is lucky to be alive, said Duff. Yeah, he's been through it all, that's for sure. Everybody thought he was a goner last year when he was in that hospital down in Boston. He was there for months, wasn't he? Well, he came out of it, and Professor McIntyre was shocked. Oh, yes, his art professor friend. He's got a good 20 years on her. Jones flicked the high beams as the road darkened through a birch thicket ahead, and the jeep's large tires crunched the snow tracks. 34 years old, and I guess he's 62. I heard she likes to spend his money, said Duff. I guess Dr. Povich's wife had some bucks, and his college texts are popular. Jones laughed and zipped through the woods. You know all the dirt on campus, Duff. You ought to start a gossip column for the school paper. Maybe start with the way this telescope was refurbished. But I guess that feud was smoothed over tonight. I'm very surprised that Father Gallagher asked Povich over to the rectory. They hate each other, said Duff. The money from the Elton Foundation was set to refurbish St. Bart's. 
Tawny Fox turned in the road ahead and his eyes glowed in the headlights' glare. He scurried into the darkness. I can't believe Povich took on Gallagher like he did. Every cent went into this telescope. Elton's governing board leans toward churches and non-profit endeavors. Povich convinced them of the observatory's merit in getting the money. Well, it may be a little bit more complicated than that. What did Father Gallagher say to him? Oh, you don't want to know exactly what Gallagher said to him. I thought he was a priest. Well, he is, but don't ever back him into a corner. He used to box and was a football player at Notre Dame. Without the Elton money, he was left to raise the 600000 for the church renovation himself. Jones gazed at the Hamilton lights twinkling across the valley. The brighter Prince William City glare unfolded beyond the Devonshire hills to the west. I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall at that rectory tonight. Duff tapped his fingers on his thigh and looked out the side window. Jones shifted along a cable fence, supported by cement posts, half buried in the snow near the cliffs. He turned onto a long, straight, wooded stretch. In the field beyond, two cars spewed smoky exhaust into the cold night air and cast their headlights across a chain gate. Oh, no, said Jones. What? Duff turned. Bucky Driscoll, why is he still up here? Fred Dempsey's maroon minivan was to the left, and parked diagonally across the mountain road was a dark brown Ford Focus. The door was marked in bold green letters, Campus Security. Oh, he's probably supposed to unlock the gate for us. Jones pulled alongside the minivan and rolled down his window. He was about to lean over to talk to Fred when the rotund Bucky, in his blue and gold security uniform, swung a huge sledgehammer through the air. What the hell is he doing? They don't call him campus insecurity for nothing, said Duff. Bucky's glasses slipped down his humongous nose and his foggy breath billowed into the night. He grunted as he bashed the gate lock. His heavy winter coat was draped over the hood of the van. Hasn't he ever heard of a key? Well, Matthias, welcome to Mount Polaris, said Fred Dempsey, smiling from the minivan. Jones stared at Bucky, and then he turned to the dark-haired Dempsey. The Fletchers want campus security to have all the keys. A sudden crunch and the sound of glass breaking sent Jones from the Jeep. Duff followed him around the minivan. Fred Dempsey looked on in astonishment as Bucky pulled a sledgehammer out of the van's smashed headlight. Bucky, you just hit my headlight! Hey, I ain't one to give up! I'm just glad to be alive to live another day! Bucky lifted the hammer into the air again and everyone moved back. He growled like a distraught bear, swung again, but missed the lock and fell backward into the snow. Sitting on the icy road, he pointed at the lock. You stupid lock! Jones rushed forward and rubbed his hands in the cold. Bucky, where's your key? Still sitting in the snow, Bucky shook his head and pulled a cluster of keys from his coat pocket. He pushed his wire rim glasses back up his nose, and with his mouth hanging open, he focused on the keys. Nope, she ain't here. Got them all numbered. Jones zipped his parker. He tightened his face in the cold as he looked at Duff and Fred. Fred alternated glances between the broken headlight and Bucky. Well, why don't we all get back in our cars? Dr. Povich will be along shortly and he should have a key. Nope, nope, he don't. I took it away, said Bucky, using the hammer handle to leverage himself up. He grabbed both sides of his belt and tried to yank his trousers over his stomach. You see, Dr. Povich having that key would be a violation of school policy. Jones' fingers were numb and his nose stung. I'm going back to the Jeep. Come on into the minivan, Matthias, said Fred. Fred gawked at the broken headlight as he passed and slid the van's side door open. Big band music shook the speakers as Jones and Duff crawled inside the warmer air. Jones slid the door shut. Once Fred was back inside, he leaned forward and squinted. What a loose cannon! Nigel hired him. Apparently he had a good record at some school in New York. Yeah, ding-dong school, said Jones. Bucky, the back of his pants now soaked, returned from the campus security car with a hacksaw. What's he going to do now? Duff leaned forward. Coach, he's going to try and cut that thick chain with that little hacksaw. Jones pushed the illuminated dial on his watch. Oh, mercy. Fred, why don't we just walk the rest of the way? It's another mile, Matthias. If it were summer, I would. Jones closed his eyes for a second and reclined in the seat. 
He thought about the open chain on the bottom gate at the base of the mountain. Wait a minute, didn't he open the bottom chain? Wouldn't they have the same key? Well, that would be logical, wouldn't it? Asked Fred. Jones nodded. Except Bucky changed them last week for security purposes. And then he lost the key, said Jones, looking out at Bucky, hacking furiously at the chain. No, he lost the key to the old lock. Fred turned down the radio, and an AM station out of Portland, Maine, began a news broadcast. He pushed the FM switch and twisted the dial for the campus station. Nice van here, Fred. You like the van? Jones checked the mileage. Is that 275,000? Van looks newer than that. No, 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 you're looking at the elapsed mileage. It's 275. I always push it to zero when I fill up on gas, so if something goes wrong with the gauge, as it has on occasion, I know how many miles I have left before I'm running on fumes. But I did cross the 140,000 mark. This van owes me nothing. I change the oil frequently. Well, that's the ticket, said Jones, peering out the side mirror. Headlights shine down the cleared snow road. Jones checked his watch. It was 7.32. Oh, good. Maybe this is Dr. Povich. The car switched to low beams. Duff turned quickly. It's Sergi's BMW. Sergi, said Jones, smiling briefly at Bucky, still hacking the thick chain out front. Unless the doctor has a key, I don't know why we're all so enthusiastic. Bucky is still soaring out there. We could be here all night. The gray BMW slowed and stopped behind Jones's Jeep. Jones slid open the van door and hopped into the frigid air. The BMW's driver's window electronically moved downward, and the bearded Povich, bushy brows blending into his fur-lined hat, peered up at Jones. Problem, Matthias? he asked tersely. Jones moved closer to his puffy brown eyes. Povich was usually a congenial man with a good sense of humor, but he did not seem happy right now. Bucky, he lost the key to the gate. Povich rolled his eyes, adjusted his cashmere scarf, and put on his brown leather gloves. Then he opened the door, slowly swung his body around, and stuck his feet into the snow. He grabbed the edges of the door and lifted himself up. Jones was not sure whether he would insult Povich by taking his arm, but readied himself in case the doctor fell. Povich shuffled in slow motion across the snow to the front gate, where Bucky was still soaring wildly and swearing openly. Jones could see no progress as he cut the cold metal. Excuse me, Mr. Driscoll, said Povich. Steam moved upward from the elongated, sweaty stretch along Bucky's back. In the cold air, he curled his lip upward and breathed heavily. Huh? I believe you misplaced the key. Ah, oh, don't you worry, Dr. Povich. I've had years of experience in security. Jones rolled his eyes and jumped up and down to negate the effects of the cold. He had coached football games in colder weather than this, but at least he could run up and down the sidelines. Your hat, said Povich. Oh, I don't need no hat. The cold in me. Hey, we're good buddies, said Bucky, and with saw in hand, he faced the chain again. No, the other day in my office you taped the key to the visor of your hat. Jones looked to his right and retrieved Bucky's hat from the car hood. Under the visor was a long piece of masking tape. The key was stuck to the adhesive when he peeled it back. Bucky, still looking confused, held the hacksaw in his hand. Jones pulled the key from the tape and handed it to him as Povich slowly returned to his car. Ha! No wonder I couldn't find it. Jones pinched the bridge of his nose. Bucky walked back to the chain and was about to place the key in the lock, but he dropped it in the snow. He bent over and scoured the ground. Jones threw up his hands and then stomped across the snow, almost slipping. He spotted the key near the gatepost, bent down and pinched it between his fingers. Ha <laughs> ha! You got an eagle eye there, coach, an eagle eye! Jones thrust the key into the lock and popped it. He and Duff dragged the chain back across the road, but Bucky gripped the links and ran through the snow. Jones fought to maintain his balance. With the gate now open, he moved precariously to Povich's car, and the electric window came down again. He handed the key to the doctor. Here, I think you better hold on to this, doctor. Hold it! Hold it! called Bucky as he ran from the gate. Let's not violate school policy. I need that key. I don't want to have to file a negative report. Bucky, how about we just let the doctor keep the key? Matthias, I am out of compliance. Truer words were never spoken from the mouth of man. 
Povich's window went up and he drove forward over the snowpack. Jones followed Duff into the Jeep as Fred Dempsey started forward, one headlight now illuminating the road ahead. Jones leaned out the Jeep window. Bucky stood with his hands on his hips. Tough break, Buck. You'll just have to wing it. He shifted as Bucky kept ranting at the gate, and in the side mirror kicked the snow near his car. Oh, yeah, you stupid gate. Oh, you're a pain in the ass, you know that? Bucky Driscoll. I also have an adjacent city named Prince William, a fictitious city along the coast of New Hampshire, where I can bring in a number of underworld elements and a very close friend of Jones is Coco Stefani. Deep inside his parker, his cell phone produced a muffled ring. He dug down with his gloves, finally removing the phone. Jones. Jonesy, it's Coco. Coco, I've been trying to get you since last night. Hey, man, I've had business to attend to. Besides, they just got the message to me. What's up? Don't you read the papers? Dr. Sergi Povich is dead. Well, good. What do you mean, good? Jones continued walking, moving the phone under his stocking cap. The long brick art building was visible through the knoll and a cluster of birches. He was a world-famous astronomer. Yeah? Well, he ripped that money off from Gallagher. I suppose you need me for something. A few passing students turned when Jones raised his voice. Need you? The guy was poisoned, probably at St. Bart's Rectory, and Gallagher is gone. Ah, no shit. You think Gallagher did it, huh? Jones neared the shovel path to the art building. He started up the salted incline. Don't play dumb with me, Coco. Hey, he hated Povich, Jonesy. You know it and I know it. Maybe he did do it. Do you know where he is? I don't know nothing. I need to find him, Coco, before he goes off the deep end. More than that, he may have other information. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I'll call you. Thanks. Coco recruited him to become a coach uh, for the uh, team, for the college team, and somehow Coco made gambling money, or makes gambling money, uh, through his funding of the athletic program at the college. And the, uh, the pompous... Fletchers run the college and the town and uh, own a uh, paint factory in Prince William, New Hampshire. And the uh, and the Fletchers are the ones in charge, but they uh, they, they always seem to be aloof and uh, and always fearful of the college's reputation being harmed. Jones has an ally in town, the local police chief George Strickland. Strickland is, like Jones, one of the few sane people in the uh, town. Matthias Jones. It's George. I tried your cell phone. The battery's gone. It's a long story, George. I'm off the air until I get back to Hamilton. We've been covered something significant in the Povich case. He looked at Coco and then at Gallagher. What did you find out? One of Phillips' men located a witness four blocks from the rectory. Witness to what? Well, this woman saw a blue Mercedes drop Duff Davis off at Lowry's Drugstore on Davenport and 16th mid-afternoon. You're kidding. Elsie McIntyre. Yes. I have Duff in custody. Kevin is on his way over and we can't find McIntyre. Jones thought about Duff's motive again. What does Duff say to all this? Says he was in the area, but he hitchhiked over to Prince William. Says he was picked up by an older gentleman in the Mercedes. He's lying. He's nervous and he's talking to L.G. Bentley about representing him. And um, Strickland has a host of deputies and uh, people who they, they sort of bumble through the crimes and everything else and have their own idiosyncrasies um, that uh, allow the humor to seep in in the midst of the murder. One of the driving forces in I should say driving idiots uh, is Bucky Driscoll. Bucky Driscoll is the campus security cop who wants to be more than he is. He wants to be a real cop. That interferes with investigations all the time. Bucky rounded the cinder block corner and tried to zip up his fly, but the zipper was stuck. Jones turned back to Fred. I'll keep this confidential, of course. Stupid zipper! 
Bucky entered the office, still yanking at the zipper, and then finally pulled it up. The heat from the long metal wall units warmed the office, but Bucky positioned his stocking cap over his forehead and zipped up his heavy coat to the neck. Yeah, you know, Matthias, my sister wants to go out with you. Jones stared at Bucky's large nose and protruding teeth and wondered what the sister would look like. Great. Then the campus security man maneuvered himself between Jones and Fred. So, Dr. Dempsey, I want you to know that I've been doing some observing in my backyard telescope. Oh? asked Fred, smiling at Jones. Yeah, I've been studying Tranquility Base. You know, Tranquility Base where Buzz Armstrong landed on the moon in 69? That's Neil Armstrong, Bucky, said Jones. Flag is still flapping up there. Fred edged Jones toward the door. Well, that's quite impossible, Bucky. The moon has no air. Ah, well, there's a lot of hot air down here, though, said Jones as they passed the befuddled Bucky and headed back to the main observatory. And again, back in Prince William, you have the district attorney, the pompous Herbert Lane, who, when he gets on camera, tries to get his toupee in place. And uh, Lane is... On the borderline sleazy, connected with Mayor Pacata, who is definitely sleazy. And then you have another ally of Jones, Kevin Phillips, on the police department in Prince William, as well as the police chief, Don Pacheco. But Phillips and Jones are more of the same age and are connected a lot better. Jones also is connected with Father Gallagher, who uh, is a local priest in a parish in Prince William, which brings in a whole assortment of other characters and circumstances into the novel. The first audio book that I put up of the Jones series is The Strange Death of Dr. Povich, which begins at the observatory up in Mount Polaris, overlooking Hamilton at the college's observatory. And that's about all I'll say about it, other than the fact the guy collapses and dies inside the telescope area. A whole host of suspects immediately bubble up for Jones as he gets involved, because he was right there when Povich bit the dust. And then the second one that's uh, probably going to be out in May of 2016 is called Funeral March for the Maestro. We have the conductor of the Prince William Philharmonic Orchestra, who is shot dead in the conservatory at Hamilton College as he's playing his cello as he does every morning at 9 a.m. Poor old Lark Larson, the former bumbling coach whom Jones replaced, is seen fleeing from the conservatory by Jones as he's running his baseball camp during the summer. There was a shot fired as Lark was inside, a second shot, which is the key to the story. So this is a whole different series, and um, it's something that uh, has some humor in it and uh, is enjoyable to listen to, as well as trying to solve the crime and, and see who, who done it. This is Robert P. Fitton. I think I hear the police car, and I think I've been solving murders in Hamilton, New Hampshire and beyond. Check out Fitton's time travel and all Fitton books at audible.com.